Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to I Care For Your Brain with me, board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Sullivan. I am here to speak with you tonight about something that is very, very interesting to me with some research that is hot off the press. And this is about the brain's immune system. Now we have gone through a lot of different thinking about the brain's immune system, but it seems like we have finally landed on the truth. This is very recent research, even starting at three to four years ago. So it's a very important topic for any of us in the brain health community and just another slice of information and education for all of you special folks out there. So the immune system in the brain is different than what we call the body or the peripheries immune system. And what we used to think is that they were two totally separate things. And what we're gonna learn about tonight is that they're actually a very integrated system. So they're very reciprocal. They communicate back and forth. And in fact, they seem to have their own secret language that we're just learning. What we call the immune system that is in the brain is the neuroimmune system. And this is different in that it has specialized immune cells that the rest of the body doesn't really have. And there are different chemical and electrical interactions that happen between the body's immune system and what is happening in the brain. And the whole point of this specialized system is to be able to identify and remove any pathogen that we don't want in the brain. So this would be a bacteria, a virus, any type of a microorganism. So like I said, the thinking on the brain's immune system has really changed over time. We used to think that the immune system stopped here and that the brain had nothing at all to protect it, which didn't really make sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Then we were taught that the brain's immune system was completely different and disconnected from the body's immune system. And that's really what I was trained to believe. But now what we know is that these two viewpoints are too extreme. And really the truth is, is that they were put out prematurely and we're just starting in the last few years to understand that there's similarities and differences, but ultimately it is a reciprocal system. So the immune reactions in the brain are different in that they are slower and less intense than in the rest of the body. Like I said, there's kind of a, a secret language that immune cells in the body and in the immune cells in the brain speak. And what scientists are trying to figure out is what exactly is that language? So this topic was inspired to me by an article that came out this week from the researchers at Washington University School of Medicine who actually discovered how the immune system monitors what is happening in the brain and how it uniquely responds if it detects any of these funky cells, the infection, uh, a brain injury, even something like a stroke or Alzheimer's disease. So what they figured out is that neuroimmune cells live in the meninges of the brain or the spinal column. So the meninges are three layers of membranes that hang out directly over the brain. We used to think that they were just there to physically protect the brain, but now with this new discovery, we understand that this is really the seat of the immune system in the brain. So the one on the outside, uh, this is the toughest one. This is called the dura mater, which means hard mother. The meninges in the middle is called the arachnoid, and this is because it kind of looks like a spider web. And the one that's on the inside of the brain, almost touching it, the most delicate, the innermost one is something called the pia mater, and that means soft mother. And so what we now know is that these immune systems hang out in these coverings of the brain, and when the spinal fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid that lives in the center part of our brain, washes over the brain as it does several times a day, and most intensely when we are in deep sleep at night, what these specialized cells are doing is kind of analyzing this fluid that's going across the brain and determining if there is an invader there. So it's kind of like a surveillance system. So some of this research came out of Boston University where I was lucky enough to get my PhD. And they were really the ones who figured out that during deep sleep, we're literally being brainwashed. Okay, that's what they said in their articles. And so the spinal fluid is flowing in and out like waves going in and out of our brain, helping to get rid of any accumulated metabolic trash as they call it. So we know a whole lot about the peripheral nervous system and we're starting to learn about uh, the brain's nervous uh, immune system. And this goes back all the way back to Louis Pasteur 150 years ago when he first discovered the vaccination system. This is something that we're all thinking a lot about now. So some of the most interesting parts of the immune system, just generally speaking, I wanted to share with you as we start to talk about it. So there are 62 different types of cells that are involved in the immune system in a human being. 
each one is specifically tuned to the teeny tiniest little bit of chemical changes that happen in the brain. It's like if there's a little bit of a change, these immune cells just swoop in, they do a little analysis and they decide, can they handle the situation or do they need more friends, more immune cells, more specialized immune cells to come into the, that part of the body now or maybe they're gonna time them so they can come in in the future. We know that there are four main organs of the immune system. This is the thymus. This is a little organ that lives right about here. It's really interesting because it is the biggest when we are young and by the time we're in our 80s, it actually changes from an immune organ into just kind of a sack of fat that lives right here. Uh, another immune system is our bone marrow and then we also have our spleen and then we have our lymph nodes. So these are the places where the immune cells grow. This is where they hang out until they're needed. The lymph nodes are interesting because basically they're closer to different parts of our body and they can basically send out uh, signals to detect if there's a threat. And if they do, they try to pull them into the lymph nodes to get them away from the rest of the body. So we've known for some time that each of these four immune organs have a ton of connections with the brain more so than any other part of the body. We also have the vagus nerve, which we, is very hot in neuroscience right now. And this is a physical connection from the gut into the brain, which provides a pathway for these immune systems to have their reciprocal connections. We really didn't know much until about 2015. Isn't that absolutely amazing? And the big discovery came when we figured out what type of cells make up the brain's immune system, because turns out they're not like what we see in the body. So this is what we call glia or specifically microglia cells. We also have mast cells in our brain, which are not in the rest of our brain. These specialized cells provide surveillance, like I said before, just specifically to the brain. So when there is any type of immune concern that happens in the brain, our blood-brain barrier and the barrier that covers our spinal cord opens up a little bit more, a little bit more to let more immune cells in. So normally the brain, uh, blood-brain barrier is a very, very tight, like a mesh type system, and it's very, very teeny where there's um, holes. So that way, big sized cells, which typically tend to be the pathogens, can't get in. It's a physical barrier against things getting into the brain and it does us a lot of good. We also know sometimes it does us harm in that it's been difficult to find ways to get chemotherapy, for example, into the brain for things like brain cancer. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, we also know that the immune system in the brain is what modulates neuroinflammation. Now this is a whole nother topic we could talk about someday, but what is interesting to know is is that inflammation in the brain might not necessarily be the enemy we all think it may be. We know in the body systemic chronic inflammation is no good, but now what they're wondering if neuroinflammation is more of an effect than a cause. So is this actually a good sign that the immune system is able to hone in on the brain to repair tissues, to respond to brain injuries and brain disease of all kinds? So it might seem worse because the skull, which holds the brain obviously, is super finite. It is very, very tight in there. And when we have an immune response, we have more cells, right? We have more fluid. That's what you can see after a mosquito bite, right? You start to have a little bit of swelling, starts to itch. We just don't have that much space in the brain. So these microglial cells, these are really the basis of this brain's unique immune system. Really interesting thing is they can only replicate about 50 times in someone's lifetime. And you can do that over years and years. But once we get to after 50, we start to see mistakes in the pattern of the uh, repetition of the cells and then they start to not work as good and this is why they think as we get older we can become more susceptible to things like meningitis and different types of dementia so this is a super hot topic right now in neuroscience a lot of the insights that we have about the brain's immune system really came through the study of stress that's really how we've done most of it and interestingly it comes a lot from animal research and also college students and I'll explain that in a minute there is a group of folks out there studying this called neuroimmunologists, and they recognize that something happens after someone is very stressed out, like to the point of the fight, flight, or freeze response. And what they figured out is there's a modulating behavior. So basically something about stress at some point in the stress cycle has the ability to actually change the way the immune system works. That pretty fascinating, okay? So it's not that it shuts off the immune system, but there is a timing issue. So real quick about college students, um, anyone who's ever taken Psychology 101, especially in the United States, you will know that part of your work in that class will be to 
participate as a research subject for people's research. Typically, you know, you have to do three in one semester, and basically it's how a ton of American psychology research is done. So what they did in this set of studies is they studied college students before, during, and after their final exams, especially when there was high stress, high, high risk involved with that, when students didn't feel quite prepared. And what they found is just before and during the stressor, the immune system is actually working really good. It's kind of on overdrive, but it's, it's good. It's able to get invaders really quick. It's enhanced. When the crisis resolves, if that crisis was short term, if that student was only worried about that test in particular, then the immune function would go back to normal. It rebounds, it recovers. But like we have learned so many times here in I Care For Your Brain, the problem is not stress, it's chronic stress. So what happens when stress doesn't go away, like for so many of us? Well, guess what? After the stressor is over, the immune system gets very wonky and becomes very inefficient. And so this is why so many of us, myself included, in the past before I learned about this stuff, um, I would do very well during the crisis. I would know I was stressed out, but then when I would take my break, uh, anyone who knows me a few years ago, my family will tell you that I would get sick on vacation all the time. I would take the train back home to see my family during Christmas. I would get sick on the train. I would fly somewhere and try to be relaxing. My throat would start to hurt. I would get a cold. I would get the flu. So as soon as I jump off the treadmill, so to speak, as soon as my stressor was over, this is when your immune system is suppressed and goes down, okay? No good, right? Because you really need that rest to recover. So part of what happens in that period when you're not feeling good, when you get sick, is that you have an increase in a very specific type of cell. This is called a cytokine. This is a group of substances that get secreted by certain cells in the immune system. And what happens when there's too much is that we just don't feel well. We feel sick. We can almost feel kind of like depressed. That's like the run down kind of a feeling. We also know that during this time of these cytokines being produced too quickly, we have a disruption in what we call growth factor production and neurogenesis. And if you are a part of my stroke community, you know that this is neuroplasticity. So this is why we're sitting here talking about it is because anyone who is interested in the healing of your brain, it turns out that the immune system and chronic stress is a real modulator of how well your brain can recover from an injury. So this is a very important message. Chronic stress doesn't just zap us of our energy and make us feel run down, it really is bad for the brain. So this is uh, super important and we really hope that understanding this brain immune system reaction in more detail is a very hopeful area of research. I have read some studies that even talk about things like is this the gateway to uh, you know, getting rid of Alzheimer's disease? Is this really the way to uh, encourage the brain to rewire and regroup faster after a stroke? We just don't know. Like I said, it's very recent research, so we're just gonna keep our ear to the scientific journals. But as always, what I'm interested in and sharing with you is that education piece we just did, but you know I love the practical application, right? So how can you apply these things I just taught you into your life? And I know all of you out there in the brain health community love information, that's why we're a good match together. So the research suggests that there are really three most efficient, effective, bang for your buck things that you can do to improve the health of your immune system. And remember, now you know, they are one and the same. They're different, but they're complementary and they speak, right? So anything that's good for your body's immune system will be good for up here. One of the strongest supports in the research is to maintain a healthy weight. There's something about the way fat cells hold on to stress over time that can put the body in a state of chronic stress. And so even just losing 10 pounds, if you're able to really get down to what your you know, BMI, whatever that means, whatever you and your doctor decide is a healthy weight, it doesn't have to be skinny, it just means not carrying around as many fat cells in your body. The second one is of course reducing that chronic stress, re relaxing, releasing your nervous system, not constantly feeling like you have to focus on the next thing to do, that there's always one more, one more, one more. The three things that really help with that are being in nature, 
yoga and meditation. Those are the three best things to help your body kind of feel like it can take a little vacation for a minute and not be in a hypervigilant state of mind. The third one is to eat a diet rich in antioxidant and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these are things like omega-3 fatty acids. I wanted to be able to give you specific foods with this in mind to, again, make this information as accessible and as practical as possible. So I found the USDA tested over 100 foods from all categories and they came up with they consider to be an authoritative list of the top 20 antioxidant foods. So I'm going to run through those real quick because I think some of these will surprise you. What do you all think is the most high in antioxidants food in the world? I would love to hear what you all have to say. If I were to be asked that question, I think I would say something like blackberries, leafy greens, kale, I would kind of be in that category. Okay, so I'm looking here. Okay, let me know what you have to say. Okay, the very first food high in antioxidants is small red beans. Beans, beans, beans. Nutritionists love beans. They are the perfect combo of protein and carbohydrates, and we are able to process them. They're a complex carb, so they give you energy all throughout the day. They have a ton of protein in them, and they're just really chock full of all sorts of awesome things. Next one is wild blueberries. Next one is red kidney beans. The fourth one is pinto beans, and the fifth one is cultivated blueberries. So that's interesting. Wild, a little bit better than cultivated. So in our top five, you all, we have three beans. Okay, so power to the bean. Uh, number six is cranberries. We have artichokes, blackberries, so I was right there, prunes, raspberry strawberry, red delicious apples, granny smith apples, pecans, sweet cherries, black plums, russet potatoes, I love that, something positive for the potato, black beans, plums, gala apples, and dark leafy greens. So tell me of all of those, which one can you incorporate into your life, into your brain health starting today? Eating the rainbow, you've probably heard of that. It's a really good rule of thumb. Try to eat all the different colors. The things with the most unique colors that you see the fewest amount of times are typically the richest in vitamins and minerals that we don't get too much. So you've always heard probably purple foods are really good, red foods, that kind of a thing. So I would be so grateful if you would help me get the word out about this brain health empowerment, education, mission that we are on. If you can share this video on your wall or any Facebook groups you belong to for the brain health community, we would be so grateful. If you like this kind of learning, if you're interested in more science-based brain health information, please join us at our next Brain School, October 14th, we're gonna be talking about evidence-based methods for improving your memory. We're gonna break down memory problems. They're very complicated. It's not as simple as your memory's good or it's bad. There's many, many, many components. I'm gonna teach you how it is a neuropsychologist looks at memory and what we do to test for it. I want to teach you what works for memory, what doesn't work. I'm gonna review many of the popular brain health products on the market, things like coconut oil, things like Prevagen. You get to find out my thoughts on that. It's about an hour, hour and a half live lecture. You get a 68 page workbook sent to your email that has all my slides, um, articles in here. This one I think is about chronic pain, 10 things to know about concussion, uh, mental strategies for improving memory, we talk about something called active listening, which is very important for making sure you're actually attending to the information that you're trying to learn. You can watch it live with me on October 14th, or once you sign up, you get a link, you can watch it anytime. It is literally yours forever. You will get the link in a few hours after I do the live lecture. So sign up in the comments, or you can come visit us at our website, icfyb.com backslash school, okay? The other thing I have in the comments is a video that came out from BU, Boston University, yay, that shows an actual video of that cerebral spinal fluid when someone is sleeping going all through the brain. I would love for you all to take a look at that because with brain health, the truth is the more you know, the more you can advocate for yourself and the less stress and anxiety you will have because you will understand how to help yourself. And that's really why I'm here. So I will see you all next week. I hope you all have a wonderful, safe week. And thanks so much for listening. Bye-bye.